All right. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Garden Hour. We have made it to August, which is pretty amazing, it seems like. And just a reminder, we will be continuing Garden Hour through this month, but our last Garden Hour is going to be August 30th. So make sure to come prepared with your garden questions and feel free to send us stuff ahead of time. We'll be with you for about another four weeks. Uh, but tonight we've got a great program planned for you. We have a new guest to Garden Hour, a master's student with the SDSU Native Plant Initiative, Gabby Bulwark. Uh, Gabby, nice to have you with us. What are you going to be talking about tonight? Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, I will be talking about the Native Plant Initiative, which is a part of SDSU. And then I'm going to talk about some of the research that we have going on with native plants. Awesome. I have gotten some plants from you and they do really great. So I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. We also have Dr. Rhoda Burrows with us. Uh, Rhoda, what's it? What's on the agenda for tonight? Well, I looked at the third monitor today and saw <laughs> that uh, uh, some of South Dakota was 108 degrees and <laughs> 116 with heat index. So <laughs> I'm going to be talking about heat effects on vegetables today. Yes, very relevant. I did make sure to water before I came down here. It, I think we got up to about 100-ish in Pierre, so not the hottest place in South Dakota, but getting well up there. And for those of you who maybe haven't met me before, I am Amanda Bachman. I'm the Pesticide Education and Urban Entomology Field Specialist for SDSU Extension, and I'm going to be covering sort of like a catch-up of what I've been up to the past month and some of the insects that I've been getting frequently asked about. And as a reminder, uh, for those of you watching us at home, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. If you're on a laptop or desktop, it's gonna be on the bottom of your screen on mobile. You might have to kind of poke around to see where that Q&A button is, but putting those questions in there uh, helps us kind of keep questions in one spot. And then we can also type answers to you or we might answer them, um, ask them live. Uh, keep an eye out on the chat. We'll be having uh, links and our contact information will pop up in there throughout the Zoom. And if you've missed any previous garden hours or want to catch up on what we've been talking about, you can always check out the recordings on our SDSU Extension YouTube channel. So with all of those housekeeping notes, we will turn it over to Gabby and the Native Plant Initiative. All right, thank you. Let me just pull up my screen here. Okay, and just want to make sure that everybody can see slides. All good? Okay, perfect. So yes, as Amanda introduced me, I am Gabby Bulwark, and I'm a graduate research assistant at SDSU and a member of the Native Plant Initiative. So today I'll give you a little bit of introduction on the Native Plant Initiative or NPI, um, I might reference it as, and highlight some of our current research and design projects. So to start off, we have to kind of address um, a problem that has been present here in the Northern Great Plains. Less than 10% of the original prairies that were here in the Northern Great Plains still exist today. And the prairies that are left um, are in a degraded state and they're lacking in number and variety of native plant species. Um, and also current knowledge of native plant restoration, production and landscaping is lacking in this region as well. But Dr. Laura Perkins came up with a solution which is the Native Plant Initiative. So we're a group of university members, including students like myself, um, faculty and staff, and we all work together to conduct research, education, and outreach to support excellence in native plant restoration and production in the Northern Great Plains. So it's kind of a, a very wide catch-all. Um, and here is an image of um, some of the steps of native plant production. So um, as you see, there's arrows kind of going all over. It's not necessarily just a cycle, but a lot of these aspects interact with each other. So where you see those yellow stars are where the Native Plant Initiative um, works within the most. So much of our efforts are in research, evaluation, and development, uh, which is in the top kind of left corner there. Um, and that is what I will discuss for the rest of the presentation. 
Um, but as a part of this research, we work to um, you know, restore the native plant communities like you can see in the bottom left there. And we also work within field establishment and evaluation. Uh, now, additionally, we do have our own um, native plant plots where we do seed collection. So the seeds that we collect, um, we are going to, or our, our aim is to sell those to distributors or practitioners um, that are looking for native plant seeds, um, you know, for restoration and such. Uh, we also have a graduate student who's working on a uh, native landscaping design portfolio. So she does um, landscaping in private and professional settings. So I will highlight her later. So as you see, we're very involved in this process. And now I'm gonna highlight um, some research that we have going on, a quick little synopsis of each project. So first we have um, two projects that are sort of related, one of which is um, my project. Uh, and that is studying the effect that different herbicides have on the germination of 17 different native plant species. So uh, those yellow kind of bins you see at the top there, those are some of the herbicides that I'm using and I use different concentrations of them to see uh, if different concentrations of those chemicals will have an effect on the germination, which the germination looks like when um, you know a little root is coming out of the seed, like you can see, in that bottom photo there. And then the other sort of related project is my colleague, Greg Cooper, who is studying dormancy of 15 different native plant species. And he is subjecting them to different temperature changes. So he transfers them from like a spring temperature to summer to fall, winter, um, and see if that has an effect and can break the dormancy of some seeds. And he's also testing whether smoke exposure, scarification, which is scratching the seed coat, or fertilizer can help to break dormancy or improve germination of native seeds. Here we have Grace Vilmo's project. She is focusing on monarch butterfly oviposition, which is egg laying preferences, um, in the 19 species of milkweed that are native to South Dakota. So she's got plots um, with all these different milkweed plants, and they check them regularly to see if there are any monarchs or eggs, larvae on those plants. Next, we have Brandon Clark and Francis Chavez project. So this one is um, trying to interpret what aspects of biodiversity um, can best increase ecosystem benefits like soil health and pollinator habitat. So they are planting varying levels of species richness, um, phylogenetic diversity, which is the relatedness of each species within the seed mixes, and genetic diversity in which they're um, testing single versus multiple seed sources. So their goal is to be able to translate the results from this project into best management practices that conservationists and landowners can use um, to have more successful restorations. And next we have Shiva Turabian's research. She is looking at the effects of ivermectin, which is a cattle dewormer, on dung beetles, dung, and soil nutrients. Um, also in related research, she is investigating the effects that ivermectin and um, a certain fungicide has on the nutrient cycle of the landscape and um, microbial community of soil in areas that have different plant diversity. Next, we have Eric Pitts, who is trying to forecast spatial change in plant communities using species distribution modeling. That um, graphic in the middle there is a species distribution model. So he will assess the impact that climate change could have on individual species and communities and where they'll be able to grow. So for example, in that image, you can see these kind of dark, like black or blue dots. Um, those are the presence of his study species um, within North America. And then those green areas are um, areas where that plant is very likely to be able to grow. And then you have the gradient moving outwards. So those red areas are where the plant is um, very likely to not grow. So he's trying to see, will those areas change with time and with different climate change models. 
Next, we have Brett Lang. Um, his project is trying to understand the changes in soil health um, and, or soil health after um, planting native perennial monocultures. So how it works is they're planting plots that have single species of a native plant in them. And then they're adjacent to a crop, so corn or soybean. And they're looking to see if there are any differences in soil health between those different species types in the plots and in the crop plot. Um, they're also going to investigate some edge effects, um, which or edge effects uh, on the impact of the native perennials on soil health. So edge effects are um, in this case, they're looking to see if the soil is like, you know, healthier as you work towards the native plants, um, seeing if those have benefits that creep into the crop fields. And here we have Robin, Robin Butterbaugh's um, design project. So she's a master's student and she also um, does uh, uh, the Native Plant Initiative's marketing and outreach for native plant distribution, so our, our sales and such. Um, and she is completing a design portfolio um, which she's using native plants and landscaping around the Brookings community. So one of these projects, um, she used prairie plants to update the landscaping in front of the Egg Heritage Museum, which is right on campus. So those are the photos, um, the two on the right hand side of the slide. And another project, she collaborated with the Landscape Architecture Department um, of Brookings to install a bioretention basin um, by their parking lot of the city county government building. Um, so that is an area that is supposed to collect and filter rainwater um, better than what was there before. So sort of related, I would love to let you all know about the native plant sale that we are having this weekend at McCrory Gardens um, as a part of their garden party. So that will be their August 6th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, at the Straw Bale House lawn, which is inside of McCrory Gardens. So we're gonna have tons of native plants there and we would love to see you there and talk native plants with you. So I would like to say thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm able to take any questions now or I will be on later um, to take note or to take questions as well. So thank you. Thanks, Gabby. Um, let's see, looking at the questions, it looks like you are currently off the hook. Um, and I was, I'm glad that you mentioned the native, the plant sale at Garden Party, because I have seen the post about it and when it was going to ask you about that, if you didn't have a slide on it. Yes. And I guess one question for that. So a lot of people think about getting plants and, you know, planting them in the spring or early summer, but, but what's the best way to get, you know, if somebody gets plants this weekend, um, what's the best time to plant those and how should they go about planting them? Oh yeah. Well, since, um, all of the plants that we sell are native to South Dakota, they should be fine as long as you um, give them proper care. So when you plant them, you want to make sure you thoroughly water that area um, and then plant you know, your little seedling and then only water it when it gets um, really dry or if you notice that they're starting to get stressed um, because we want them to acclimate to our climate. So if we're watering them you know, every day, um, they're going to get used to that and they might not perform as well um, if, you know, you miss some waterings, so. Yeah, and one thing from the picture of those, uh, the plants that you guys have for sale is you do have them in like really deep uh, plugs, which is a little bit different than how sort of people might be used to getting plants. And yes. I will say that I totally used a soil probe to dig the holes <laughs> because they yeah. were so long yes. and skinny. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. We call those cone containers because they're kind of cone shaped. But yeah, we do that so they can establish um, a better root system, you know, earlier in their life. Yeah, so really, really great plants. Lots of 
really neat species that you might not normally see at a garden center or nursery. So if you are in the Brookings area this weekend, the garden party is always a really fantastic time. And I know they've sort of split the activities over sort of two days this year. There's like their evening reception on Friday, mm -hmm. and then there's a lot of different activities and garden tours on Saturday. And I do believe uh, Dr. Christine Lang is going to be there on Saturday giving a tour. I'll have to see if I can figure out what time. But Awesome. If anybody has any more questions for Gabby, feel free to put those in the Q&A and we will revisit those at another one of our breaks. But for now, we are going to move on to Dr. Rhoda Burrows. And I know, Rhoda, that some of the questions you've already claimed <laughs> as they were coming in, I was like, that's going to be a question for Rhoda. So you can do your content and then questions or vice versa. Totally up to you. But the floor is yours. Well, I'm going to go ahead and do content because some of it will answer the question um, hopefully and if not you can you can follow up and and uh, and ask more or get after me for not getting it uh, so we're talking heat effects here um, on on our vegetables I'm not going to cover fruit today although many of the same things could be said about fruit but uh, one of the main things that we see or get questions about is flower abortion. Uh, you know, why aren't, why am I not getting beans? Why uh, are my cucumbers not setting? So forth. So uh, just some some numbers here. For beans, when you get over 85 to 90 degrees, you can start to see some flower abortion. That'll depend a little bit. Um, several things, depending, uh, including how moist the soil is, whether you have mulch, um, whether you have hot, dry winds with it. Um, if the pods do form, they may be smaller or they may be a little misshapen because they've got fewer seed because they didn't get pollinated quite all the way with the uh, with the higher temperatures. So now this is 85 to 90 degrees. Usually we're not that the whole day long. Uh, when we start getting those hot days where it only gets down to 70, possibly 75 at night, then is when we start to see more, more of the issues. Generally, if it's 95 during the day, but it drops pretty quickly at night, if you've got drier air and it gets down to say 65 at night, that will offset a little bit of that damage. So uh, those of us who are in the drier part of the state do have an advantage <laughs> on that, but then we also get the wind too. So uh, it's kind of a trade-off. You can see in the background here, I've got a picture of, of uh, bean field this was actually dry beans but uh and you can see the newer growth was just kind of dying back from the heat and we'll see a lot of that in the next week or so i imagine uh peppers once the temperature is over 90 degrees again uh, you may not see any new fruit set until it starts cooling off a bit uh, even though we think of peppers as being a hot season crop uh, they actually do like it more like 80 degrees rather than 90. Uh, temperatures over 70 at night, especially with high humidity, will decrease tomato pollination. Well, we're almost getting to that point where we're going to stop talking about tomato pollination because <laughs> we're not going to have a whole lot more time to grow fruit. But if you're seeing that you're not getting any new tomatoes and you've been over 70 at night, I know we're forecast to get that uh, in the coming week, especially with that high humidity, what it does is, is make the pollen sticky and so it doesn't stick it sticks to itself instead of the uh, stigma of the flower. Uh, so you don't get very good pollination. And everbearing strawberries, everbearing or day neutral strawberries supposed to uh, put fruit out all summer long. It'll quit during temperatures over 85 degrees. And as it cools off in the fall, then you'll start getting more flowers and strawberries again. 
And another heat effect that we sometimes get questions about is radishes just don't like to form roots in warm soil. Tomatoes, no, they actually don't like it hot. <laughs> you sometimes hear people say, well, this is great tomato weather. Well, actually, they like it from about 68 to 78 degrees is ideal for tomatoes. Um, they will ripen a little faster in the heat until it gets up to about 85 degrees. And once it's over 85 degrees, the pigments in the fruit have trouble forming. Uh, lycopene is the red and carotene is the yellow. What you sometimes see is the carotene is a little more heat tolerant. So you'll get these yellow shoulders where the sun was hitting and, and red where it was a little bit more shaded. Uh, so that's that's caused by heat. Uh, hopefully you don't get this bleaching where you actually have a, a whitish, uh, the skin turns white and, and can start to rot. Uh, and the, one thing that you really want to avoid with any of the fruit, or rather whether it be grapes or, or tomatoes or peppers, is a sun exposure of the fruit to, to light. It's almost like when you put out your transplants in the spring, the fruit isn't adapted to that extra sunshine. And so it can, can bleach out. So if you've been pruning your tomatoes at this point, you can still prune underneath the fruit, below the fruit, uh, but don't prune anything above the fruit right now because it's going to need all the shade it can get. Cucumbers and squash, temperatures over 90 degrees during the day and 70 at night, and certainly we're there right now, can tend to uh, flip the switch towards formation of male flowers, like we see here, whoops, uh, rather than female flowers. Yeah, a female will have a little bulb or a little miniature fruit right at the base of the flower. We see here, that these are all male flowers and could be caused by the heat. And so it may stop producing for a while. And then when it cools off, we'll start to see those females again. We know when it's time to take a break from the heat. Uh, many bees don't like to work over 90 degrees. Maybe Amanda wants to chop, wants to uh, weigh in on that one. but. So we can have poor pollination, and that will lead to misshapen fruit like this. The, the seeds in this area, the fat area, the cucumber uh, got pollinated, but here at the skinny end, those, those ovules did not get pollinated, and so seed didn't form, and you need the seed to tell the fruit to form. Um, same thing with this little melon here. Uh, probably did not get pollinated and so it's just sort of rotting off or had very poor pollination and uh, just a note and and john ball talks about this sometimes the temperature of a black plastic mulch on the surface when the sun is is shining on it these warm days can get over 150 degrees fahrenheit so you can imagine a poor plant, uh, if it's touching that, uh, is going to burn up pretty quick. So what can we do? Uh, first thing next year, take a look at the varieties and look for heat resistance. There is quite a difference in some varieties on how much heat they can take. Tomatoes, for example, have some heat tolerant varieties or lettuce has heat tolerant varieties. So look for those. Uh, the other thing you might want to look for is powdery mildew resistant varieties, particularly with the, some of the cucurbits. Uh, I'm thinking here specifically of cucumbers, but also some other squash. If you get powdery mildew, and that's more common during these hot, dry years, uh, it will decrease the foliage, can even kill off the foliage, and so then the fruit is exposed to the heat. So you want to avoid that. I already talked about removing the foliage. 
uh, mulch to keep the soil cool and moist, make sure those roots are able to take up water to replace what they're losing out the leaves so that they can do that evaporative cooling. Uh, same thing with water, watering, overhead watering or misting. When it's 100 degrees, you can overhead water, that's okay. Uh, you might want a lot of the infection periods will be, say, a half hour to two hours. So if you water overhead water for 20 minutes, you're probably safe uh, or misting. Uh, so those are those are options, especially misting for some of the salad greens type of things. Uh, and you can now get those little misters that are made for for your backyard. Uh, kaolin clay sprays. We think about these more for insect protection, but they can also reflect the light off the fruit and protect the fruit some. And then shade cloth, where a lot of people use hardware cloth or something has a hail netting, and so the shade cloth can work well for that too. And with that, I will turn over to the questions. Uh, let's see, green beans have tiny flowers, but no beans. What can I do to get beans? Well, you <laughs> be patient at this time and, and pray for cooler weather. <laughs> um, how important is it to keep grass away from two to three year old apple trees? And should we mulch around them? Uh, it is important, especially for one, you don't want the grass going right up to the tree because that encourages moles and other things that might chew on the trunk uh, to, to make a home there. So, so keep it several, at least several inches away. Preferably uh, your root system is going to be probably at this stage going out at two to three feet in each direction from the trunk. So go ahead and, and remove the grass from that area as well. And mulching is a good way to at least tamp down some of the uh, some of the grass that can can uh, get right next to the trunk. Um, I was going to say something else. Oh, yes. Don't pile up the mulch as a volcano. <laughs> uh, keep it away from, from the trunk a couple inches uh, to allow the trunk to air out. If it thinks it's underground, it's going to get confused. You can get the pathogens start to attack the trunk. Uh, and again, little insects and, and mice and so forth will, will live in that mulch. So keep it away from the the trunk a little bit and then a couple of inches depending on on how uh, how bulky your mulch is a real fine mulch should be a lot a lot thinner layer uh, let's see. yeah do, that do you want to take the uh milorganite question <laughs> <laughs> i did some quick googling <laughs> Milorganite, I believe, is a uh, byproduct of, of uh, sewage treatment. Yeah, it's a fertilizer. It like is a... used as a fertilizer. I would not use it for for uh, edible plants, uh, not for pathogens itself because it's processed, uh, but anything that comes through the waste stream like that can have extra chemicals in, you know, all the stuff that you clean your house with and wash down the sewer, uh, all the medicines that we <laughs> ingest and put into the sewer. <laughs> um, this, so does it deter deer from eating plants? I have no idea on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, per the company, they make no claims uh, regarding it as a deer repellent. So <laughs> I would say that no, <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> you can try and it out on your deer, but I would try it on the plant. You don't mind having the deer. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I'd go with some more uh, tried and true, some, some, you know, the fencing situations and that kind of stuff, especially for a garden. Um, 
And then I will I will take this question now about uh, bees gathering around the drain holes uh, looking for water. So yeah, bees actually do need water. Bumblebees and honeybees will you know both utilize water, um, especially for trying to, when they're making their um, hives and stuff. Um, and they just also need water to drink a little bit and cool down, especially. So if you notice them like gathering around like, you know, the saucers on pots or whatever, that's totally fine. You can definitely, you know, try to give them their own water source, but I can't guarantee they're gonna use it. <laughs> um, if you have a bird bath or any sort of water feature in your yard, you wanna make sure that you've got some large like flat stones or other sort of like rafts that bees and other insects can use if they accidentally fall in. Um, so if it's a, you know, too deep of a pool, they will fall in and drown. So give them little islands so that they can crawl up, dry off and then fly away. Um, a lot of people that have pools will complain about having a lot of bees and wasps dead in their pools. And that's what happens is they, they wanted the water, they fell in and they weren't able to, you know, climb out the side in time before they drowned. So give them an island and that will help greatly. And you can definitely do like little saucers and put a bunch of stones and stuff in there. Um, one thing with any sort of water features in your yard, um, especially ones that are stagnant, is you do want to make sure that you're emptying them out every one to two days so that you don't end up with mosquito larvae developing in them as well. So if you're watering your plants and there's water collecting in those saucers, make sure that you're dumping that out every couple of days. Otherwise, you're going to be breeding your own little local population of mosquitoes. I have a question for you, Amanda. Okay. Uh, you can get those little dunk things for mosquito larvae. Yes. BT, I believe. Yep. Would they be harmful at all to adult insects? No, those are, so it's the, so the ones that are specific for mosquitoes and other dipterin larvae, they, that's Bacillus thuringiensis, thuringiensis, the Israeliensis variety. So it is, so there is a BT that's targeted towards caterpillars, um, and this is the BT that's targeted towards uh, dipterin larvae. So they are relatively sort of low impact to um, non-target species. So that's a great reason to use some of those products is because it is very targeted management on that specific life stage of, you know, of the critter, but always read and follow the label directions, uh, <laughs> depending on the product that you're using, because there may be some, you know, reapplication uh, periods as well. So, but yeah, using, using larvicide on mosquitoes is a great way to target just the larva and then not impact some of um, the adult insects that we have out there that we're trying to conserve. So yeah, I will be talking a little bit more about mosquitoes because always, uh, let me go ahead and I will share my screen. And if anyone has additional questions, feel free to throw those in the Q&A and we will get to them after my presentation. All right, I'm gonna go with the fact that I'm pretty sure you guys can see my screen, yay. So it's been a while since I have been on garden hour. I was out at some meetings and then I was out with COVID. So finally back, happy to be here. And I just wanted to share some of the insects that I've seen in my travels and then also talk about some of the stuff that I've been getting a lot of questions about here in the office. So first cool bug that I saw actually just yesterday when I was watering is a velvet ant. So you can see that on the left side of the screen here, it's black, it's red, it's a little bit fuzzy, and it's not actually an ant at all. It is in the same order, the Hymenopterans, um, but it is actually a wingless wasp. And I always get really excited when I see these every year in my yard um, because they're really fast, they're pretty shy, they do have a reputation for having a painful sting, but honestly, I've never been able to catch one of these. They move pretty fast, and so they're not about to sort of let themselves be handled. But they are a wingless wasp. The females are wingless. The males actually look very similar, but they have really cool black wings. Um, they are predators on ground nesting bees. So I sort of take the presence of a velvet ant in my yard to mean that I have enough ground nesting bees to support their predator, which I think is a really cool, you know, sort of way to monitor the ecosystem that I've created in my backyard. Um, and then on sort of the more pest side of the spectrum, I was in uh, Des Moines, Iowa and got to tour the Iowa State Horticulture Research Farm and we were hanging out in some plots of cucurbits. So 
you know, your squashes, your cantaloupes, your cucumbers, which was very exciting for me because I spent a lot of time with those plants in graduate school back at Penn State and got to see my friend, the spotted cucumber beetle. So I was harassing that little guy for some photo opportunities, but I know for folks that are growing, you know, zucchini, yellow squash, that kind of stuff, those uh, spotted cucumber beetles can be a not welcome visitor because they will feed on the flowers and they can also vector some different bacterial diseases to those plants as well. So just some of the cool things that I've been noticing when I'm out and about. But for frequently asked insects, uh, by far at the top of the list is the cicada killer wasp. I have it pictured here alone and also with a cicada. And I'm here to tell you that this is not a murder hornet. If I had a dollar for every email or phone call that was like, I have found a murder hornet in South Dakota, I would be able to retire or at least go on a very nice beach vacation. Um, I'm very happy that people are sort of paying attention to the insects out there, but we don't have murder hornets. They have not sort of escaped the small area of Washington state where they were originally found back in 2020. Um, these wasps have been in South Dakota for a very long time and they are active when the cicadas are active. So you hear the screaming in the trees right now. These cicada killer wasps are actually hunting those cicadas and using them to provision their nests. So these wasps are solitary ground nesters. They may sort of congregate in an area, but, but that's because it's, you know, the soil type that they like, not necessarily, it's not because they're cooperating. They are still solitary. Um, and so you can see that they are fairly large. They are sort of our biggest wasp in the state, which is why they get so much attention. And they do hang out. They can be in backyards. I know here in Pierre, there's a lot of them all, all along the Lewis and Clark Trail because that is kind of a sandier soil, which they really like. But these are really not harmful to people. They may look terrifying, but they are not out to get you at all. They are out to get cicadas and other large insects. Uh, you can see here on the right, the female has a cicada. She has paralyzed it, so she stings it to paralyze it, and then she'll put it into her nest, lay an egg on it, and then that egg will consume the cicada uh, that larva will pupate and then it will emerge next year as an adult wasp. So, you know, there's really, I, I hate it when uh, people ask me how to get rid of them because they are such a cool insect and have such a neat life cycle and they're really only active for about a month in the summer. Um, but you pretty much have to like catch and kill the adults that you see in order to attempt to make any sort of dent in the population. Plus, if you have the soil type that they like, other cicada killer wasps are just going to colonize that area again the next year. So um, short of sort of really mitigating that habitat, possibly paving over some areas, you're really not going to deter them 100%. I really want people to get cool with these insects, let them live their lives, let them snack on cicadas, uh, because they are just really, really beautiful. And it's just so cool to see them like catch a cicada, fall out of a tree, and you know, half fly, half drag it back to their nest. So clearly I'm again, unsurprisingly on team insect. And then the other one that I'm starting to get a bunch of questions about are the black vine weevils. So these are actually hmm, smallish, less than a quarter of an inch, and they end up being sort of a nuisance indoors. Um, they actually, the adults will feed on lilac leaves and some leaves of other shrubs. They'll give sort of like a sawtooth um, appearance to the edge of the leaf. Um, they don't do enough damage outside to sort of warrant any sort of management. Um, and despite having wings, they don't really use them. They are weevils, so they've got the adorable cute little snout and they're really hard. They're really crunchy. Uh, weevils are surprisingly crunchy for their size. And these guys will wander inside and then kind of get stuck. They don't feed or reproduce indoors, but I get calls starting this time of year of folks who are finding them like on their bathroom walls, especially for some reason. Um, you can just knock them down, sweep them up, use a vacuum. They're not something that I would consider, you know, that warrants any sort of indoor pesticide application, especially do not use like a bug bomb on these guys. That's totally overkill and probably going to do more harm to you than to the weevil. Um, so yeah, you can just sort of knock them down, sweep them up. 
Um, you know, if you really want to stop insects from coming inside your house, uh, this is the time of year to start looking at some of those barrier treatments um, around windows and doors, um, because we are going to be sort of moving into the season where things are thinking about coming inside to overwinter or just getting sort of turned around or coming in with garden produce. Um, but yeah, the, the black vine weevils, been getting reports of those over the past week or so. And again, they're not inside to like feed or reproduce. So just a nuisance, uh, not anything that's gonna be super harmful to you or your pets. So some other insect news, I know Gabby mentioned um, some of the grad students who are working on monarchs. Um, the IUCN listed monarchs, um, they put them on their red list. So there have been a lot of news stories recently about monarchs being endangered. And while this international uh, organization has listed them as um, endangered, they're currently not federally protected in the United States. Um, so US Fish and Wildlife back in 2020 did their assessment of the monarchs, um, the migratory monarchs, so the ones that go from Mexico, you know, up through North America and then back again, and then also the population um, in California and Baja that sort of migrate in that smaller area. Um, and US Fish and Wildlife said that, you know, hey, we couldn't list these as endangered, but there are other organisms that need to be listed more, like that need to be listed more. Um, so monarchs did not make the US endangered species list and they still are not a federally protected um, species. So even with this international designation, there have been sort of no official changes in management policy, um, you know, in the United States. And maybe at some point, uh, Fish and Wildlife will change that designation and that's, you know, might change some things. But um, for now, uh, those news articles, you know, do keep in mind that, you know, they don't have federal protections in the United States right now, but there are things you can do, like go get some native plants, put some more milkweed in your yard, uh, put some things that are fall nectar sources, especially for the um, monarchs that are going to be migrating back through South Dakota and headed south here in a couple of weeks. So real quick, I need a drink of water. I had what I consider to be a mild case of COVID, but still have some of the uh, throat getting dry a lot quicker than normal, especially when I've been talking for a long time. So uh, another thing that happened while I was sort of out of state was spotted lanternfly was found in Iowa. It was just like a single, like two nymphs that were picked up, but oh my goodness, uh, this insect has gotten a lot farther west, a lot faster than I thought it was going to. So this is one to keep an eye out for. We do not have any confirmed sightings in South Dakota, but we do have Tree of Heaven, which is one of their preferred host plants. Uh, you can see from these images that they are a very distinctive insect. Uh, they are spotted and they're red and their nymphs just look like these little, little disco balls. I did not see any of these in person when I was back east. I kind of wish I did because these insects have been causing all sorts of issues and you know you just kind of want to see one in person before it shows up in your state. Um, but they will lay their egg masses on pretty much anything which is you know why we're concerned about them sort of traveling long distances because of people. Um, if they've got their egg masses you know on firewood or RVs or trailers or pallets those are all ways that egg masses can escape sort of where they were introduced originally in um, like southeastern Pennsylvania um, and sort of moving out of that quarantine area. So if you haven't heard of spotted lanternfly before, definitely go ahead and, you know, do some Googling after this. Look at the pictures, uh, check out some of the current distribution maps. Um, but it is something that, you know, I now probably expect to see it in South Dakota in the next five years. Um, it's a phloem feeder, um, so it ends up being an issue in grape production and some other specialty crops just because it can occur in large numbers. And then that sticky sap can be, you know, a place for some of the sooty molds and other diseases to grow in addition to the damage it does to the plants. So 
This is definitely not a critter that we want, even though it looks super cool. Um, but do, do keep an eye out for spotted lanternfly. And then another point of constant vigilance um, was Nile virus. We have one human case that was reported uh, late July and actually um, came out after the July 27th update. Um, and we've got five counties with positive pools in the state. So it seems like we're trending towards maybe some lower overall human case numbers in the state, but stay vigilant, wear you know, long sleeves, long, long pants, wear your repellents with EPA approved active ingredients and make sure that you are reapplying per the label directions. Uh, you know, the season West Nile virus is still out there. Symptoms can be confused with other things, um, but do make sure that you're taking precautions as you're engaging in outdoor activities on perhaps days that it's not 105 degrees. And I did just wanna share some upcoming events uh, this month and next month. Uh, I will be in Sioux Falls at Bugapalooza on August 13th. That's at the Sertoma Butterfly House uh, from 10 to two. And there's gonna be a bunch of different organizations there with tables and activities. And then also Insect Fest is at Mercury Gardens in Brookings on September 10th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So I know Mercury Gardens uh, Discovery, not Discovery Fest, um, the cool garden whatever is this weekend. Um, so make sure to check them out and hopefully we'll see some folks um, at some of these events. And I am going to go ahead and stop sharing. And let's see, yes, Gabby said that they're gonna have many types of milkweed for sale at the plant sale on Saturday. So awesome. If you're looking to add some more of that to your yard, definitely make sure to check them out. And let's see, I'm gonna take a look at the questions here. How do you treat pumpkins and squash now that you're seeing striped beetles? Huh. Yeah, so at this point in the season, uh, some of it is you may just have to let the plants uh, tank the damage. And you know, Rhoda, if you wanna chime in with <laughs> other advice too. Um, one thing too with cucurbits is that, especially if they start going down with things like bacterial wilt, you want to you know, pull those vines and trash them. Don't put them in your compost. Um, that's a way to remove that pathogen from the environment for the next season. Um, but yeah, if you've got sort of like a, an overgrown squash patch, like there's just too much surface area to really effectively treat. And also when the plants are flowering, you wanna be really careful about using any insecticides because if you hit the flowers, you're going to you know, reduce your pollination success and you're gonna have that malformed or no fruit production. So um, one thing too is the striped cucumber beetles are really good at hiding. I did work on them in grad school. They would hide under the plastic mulch, they'd hide under leaves. So it's also very difficult to even get enough um, insecticide on them for them to die. So honestly, my personal opinion, not worth it. Just ride it out. Your plants are probably going to be prolific enough that you're not going to notice the decrease in yield. Uh, Rhoda, anything to add on that one? <laughs> not really. I, if you're <laughs> usually uh, doing a fairly large patch of cucurbits, uh, one, of course, you want to rotate your location, but also you may want to consider planting uh, Hubbard squash around the outside as a trap crop next year. Yep. Yeah. And if you do the blue Hubbard as a trap, um, you can do it in greenhouse flats so that you can like move it and destroy it. Um, that's, we totally did that in grad school. That was one of our sampling plans. Um, but also like put those squash seedlings out earlier than you would think because the adult, especially squash bugs will colonize the first cucurbit that they find. And so if you get them early, you can like kind of remove some of them. So that's another, another strategy with the blue Hubbard, especially they really like that one. Uh, let's see, bagged some apples on the tree, but now the earwigs have made their homes in the bags. Well, <laughs> I'd say next year bag, like tie the bag tighter because yeah, earwigs are going to sneak in there. I mean, outside of like shaking them out and rebagging the plate or rebagging the apple, you've essentially just like made a cute little protected home for those earwigs to have a snack. <laughs> 
And earwigs like um, sort of, you know, moist environments. They tend to be like a little bit more on the no nocturnal side. Um, so, you know, if you are going to be rebagging some of those apples, like do it during the day when you don't have like a bunch of, you know, earwigs, you know, actively trying to get back in there. So, yeah. 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 Earwigs are fun. Probably not um, to you. Yeah, was that? <laughs> uh, let's see. How do you get rid of fungus gnats and in indoor plants? Uh, nuke them and start over. Um, <laughs> there are actually soil drenches that use the BT, the same BT that Rhoda um, asked me about before for mosquitoes. Different formulation, same active ingredient because these are flies. So you can, uh, you usually fungus gnats are because you're kind of overwatering, they need moist soil conditions. So you wanna make sure that you're letting that soil dry out completely in between waterings and then use a soil drench. Um, especially if these plants are just strictly indoors, they're not going outdoors. Um, you're just going to have to treat everything. So every plant in the house, you are going to want to do the soil drench um, and then make sure afterwards that you are letting that soil dry out in between waterings to kind of interrupt that life cycle. Uh, the adults, though, you're just going to have to, you know, squish and deal with until they kind of run out. Um, let's see. So uh, I have a YouTube link. This is a bold move. Um, wasp dragging off a Colorado potato beetle. Oh, so that just looks like one of our regular um, European paper wasps, which is pretty cool. Uh, so one thing a lot of people might not realize is that wasps are predators. They will actually hunt prey and they use that to feed their larva. So this is why things like yellow jackets, you know, interrupt the summer barbecue to try to like you know, in addition to wanting some of your soda, because the adults use like the sugar or nectar for energy for themselves, but they are going to go to a protein source because that's what they're going to take back to their nest for their larva. So yeah, wasps are great. They're great hunters in the garden. Um, I've got a very healthy colony of European paper wasps and the years that I grew kale, I did not have a huge problem with cabbage white caterpillars because the wasps would carry off the caterpillars. They did a really great job of, you know, hunting some of those soft-bodied insects out of the garden. Um, so, so that's what's up with that. That's a really, really cool video. Thank you for uh, sharing that with us. And then let's see. Studies of increase and decrease of specific insect populations in South Dakota. If not, how is the amount of pests that I have? Okay, I'm not quite sure. I fully understand the question, but I'll go for the first part. Um, we have researchers that are doing work on like bumblebee monitoring is really big right now. That project is just kind of kicking off with uh, the Bumblebee Atlas project with Fish and Wildlife and Xerces Society. Um, and then as far as like, you know, some of our different crop pests, you know, there have been studies over the years on certain pests there. Like, for example, in sunflower right now, um, Adam Varenhorst and his lab are doing a lot of work on red sunflower seed weevil. Um, because they are showing some resistance to certain insecticide active ingredients. And so that's impacting management. Um, as far as like amount of pesticide application, like how is that determined? Uh, a lot of that is determined by the company that is developing the insecticide. I mean, they run trials on active ingredients. They run efficacy trials. They will contract out to um, universities and other like unbiased partners to run, you know, double blind trials to see, you know, what application rates work for what pests. So there is a lot of research that goes into it. It's not just an arbitrary number that gets put on those labels. Um, I did sweet corn pesticide efficacy trials when I was a graduate student. And we would just have, you know, like numbers on the data sheet. We didn't know, you know, what the active ingredient was. So, you know, we weren't biased that way. But we would, um, you know, spray the sweet corn with the different treatments and then harvest and assess uh, damage. So that's kind of a partial answer, I hope, on that one. Amanda, so, yeah. is there a threshold val value for when a city determines to spray mosquitoes? Um, the threshold is pretty much, are the vector species present? Are the vector species active? Uh, for public health, the thresholds are pretty low. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there are, you know, nuisance mosquito 
species. Um, and those are some of our more like day flying active ones. And, you know, those alone are not caused for mosquito spraying, but it is the, the vector species. Um, yeah, I actually had a sample from uh, Aberdeen. Somebody wanted to know what all these dead insects were on their patio. And it turns out they were mosquitoes. Um, mosquitoes, uh, because Aberdeen is a, one of the towns that has a really robust um, area-wide mosquito control program because they are always one of our first counties that have uh, West Nile virus positive mosquito pools. So it was, you know, the mosquito applications were working. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we've got just a little bit of time left. Uh, Gabby, Rhoda, any closing thoughts this evening? Well, get your hoses out and get ready to water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, since John Ball isn't here, we'll say water, water your trees too. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Put the PSA out there for the trees. <laughs> yeah, and I'd just like to say thank you again for having me. And if anybody has questions about native plants at all, um, please reach out to the Native Plant Initiative. We're on Facebook and Instagram. You can check out our website um, on the SDSU page. So thank you very much. Awesome. When are you yeah. going to have a sale out west? You know, we tried this year. We tried to have one. I think it was a, we were going to at Reptile Gardens, but it just didn't pan out. So we, we need a, a greenhouse uh, operator in the area that wants to host us. <laughs> Well, anytime you guys want to come back to Pier, maybe in 2023, maybe it won't be 105 degrees. <laughs> that would be ideal. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, everybody. And thank you to the attendees that joined us and gave us great questions. We will be back here same time on August 9th. So be sure to join us then. And in the meantime, uh, stay cool, water your plants, water your trees, and have a good rest of your week. Mm -hmm.